would like to continue where I um, finished yesterday, and I told you that um, one of the processes which I would like to um, speak about today is um, this spreading process over here, which I uh, you know, sort of explained yesterday, uh, where the blusterderm, which is sitting on, on, on top of this very big yolk cell, starts to spread around the yolk cell. <coughs> and this spreading process is mediated by two different cellular rearrangements. One is that an epithelial cell layer on the surface of the uh, blusterderm, which is called the enveloping cell layer, undergoes active spreading. So it's not increasing its volume, but it spreads. It becomes very thin and large. And the other process, which I, you know, in the second half of the talk we'll talk about, is how deep cells are rearranging and how this rearrangement of deep cells is orchestrated with the spreading of the epithelial cells in, in this process of tissue spreading uh, um, at the onset of zebrafish gastrification. OK, so, so um, uh, the, the, the uh, first part of my talk will be about the uh, force generating mechanisms by which epithelial cell layer spreading is being uh, triggered during this process of epithelial here. And um, I just put in this schematic diagram. Um, there, there have been different models how epithelial cell layer spreading is being uh, triggered. And um, in this schematic here, what you can see is a fish embryo. <clears throat> Again, at the onset of gastrulation, the EVL, which is the squamous epithelial cell layer on, on the surface of the embryo, um, has made it halfway over the, uh, um, over the yolk cell here. And what had been noted uh, a number of years ago is that there's uh, you know, a significant accumulation of actin and myosin right at the margin where these EVL cells are making contact to the underlying yolk cell. And this accumulation of actin and myosin appeared to be in a ring-like fashion, in a, in a sort of a cable-like fashion. And what had been sort of speculated by a number of studies, including our own lab here, is that this ring might be a, cons uh, a constricting ring. And once it, has, once it moves over the equator of the yolk cell, it just needs to constrict. And then it couples to the uh, uh, curvature of the uh, yolk cell. And it can pull on the margin of the EVL and can pull the EVL downwards. Right. So that was sort of an attractive hypothesis which we could experimentally address. And what we wanted to do is to see if that is the only mechanism by which, uh, you know, the, if, if it is an, a mechanism at all, and if it's the only mechanism by which uh, the EVL makes it over the yolk cell. One sort of uh, limitation of this model of, uh, you know, having a constricting uh, actomyzing ring is that, you have, that uh, force generation and pulling on the margin of the EVL can only happen once the ring has moved over the equator, right? Because if it you know, would constrict before the equator, it would just go in the opposite direction. <clears throat> so we had, to, you know, we had to assume that the EVR spreads by an unknown mechanism up, it had, you know, up to the point where it sort of crosses the equator. And then this actomyzin uh, um, ring would uh, get into action, constricting and pulling on the margin of the EVR and pulls it on this. OK. So that was sort of the uh, starting condition. And uh, the first thing we did is we wanted to visualize actin and myosin in real time in the embryo. So we generated two <coughs> transgenic lines, one uh, transgenic line which um, visualizes myosin, and the other transgenic line which uh, visualizes uh, actin. And um, consistent with previous uh, uh, observations on the accumulation of actin and myosin in this process, what we find is that indeed there is an accumulation of myosin and an accumulation of actin in this region of the yolk cell over here, which is overlapping with this assumed actomyosin ring, which might pull on the margin of the EVR and pulls it up. So, so these observations were consist um, consistent with previous observations that there is indeed actinomyosin accumulating at the position where the EVR makes contact to the yolk cell, and that it could, in principle, act as an actomyosin uh, constricting ring, which pulls the EVR downwards. OK. <clears throat> Then a PhD student in the lab, Martin Bernd, he, um, together with Stefan Gild, actually addressed at this time, he thought that we are, we're going to use a UV laser cutter to see how forces are being generated within this actomyosin ring to see if it is exclusively acting as a constricting actomyosin cable. OK, so the experiment which Martin did here is <clears throat> we are just looking over at this little window here, and we are looking at actomyosin accumulation in this ring like fashion here. He did cuts in different orientations. <clears throat> And what he assumed is if he is doing a cut in a, uh, a perpendicular uh, um, orientation to the margin of the EVL, he will reveal a lot of recoil. And this recoil will be uh, um, um, uh, proportional to the tension along this circumference within this actomyosin band. And he did also control cuts over here, which he's cutting parallel to the margin of the EVL. And he's, he, he was expecting if it would be a simple uh, um, uh, contractile ring, he would re reveal um, a much less tension along this uh, this orientation than along this orientation here, right? So he's um, monitoring, but you're monitoring recoil, and um, we are, we are um, deducing from the recoil then the tension. 
Okay, this is what is happening. Um, if you cut uh, perpendicular to the margin of the EVR, there's indeed a, yeah, a significant recall here in this orientation indicating that there's tension around the circumference, which again would be uh, consistent with the idea that this is a, con a constricting actomyosin ring. But what, what was more surprising is when we did these control cuts over here, that there was actually a significant amount of tension also um, uh, perpendicular to the, along the width of this actomyosin band here. So that indicated that perhaps it is not exclusively a simple constricting actomyosin ring, but, but there might be something more about it, which um, you know, might generate forces. Ah, because the, the, the time scale of this experiment is in seconds, I mean, and, and the ring moves in, in the time scale of minutes, down, minutes to hours. Down, so the, the total movement from its formation up to the point where it closes is approximately seven hours, six to seven hours. And here we're looking at the time scale of a few seconds. <clears throat> so it is actually, I mean, if you look down here, there's a little bit of movement, but, you know, that's hardly very hard to recognize. Okay, <clears throat> this is a quantification of the recoil velocity. And at different stages um, of EVL epiboly, so at different stages of uh, the ring position, basically, it, it, you know, it, it gives you an estimate where, the, where this actomyosin ring is at different stages of epiboly. In this case, the actomyosin ring is approximately at the equator. Here it has crossed the equator, and then it is halfway down, and it nearly reaches the, the bachelor pole down here. And uh, if you look now at the uh, tension, these are the perpendicular cuts where you uh, reveal circumferential tension, and these are the horizontal cuts where you reveal tension along the width of the actomyosin band. If you just look uh, at this stage here before the ring has crossed the equator, it, it was quite surprising to see that uh, circumferential tension and the tension along the width of the actomyosin band were actually not far apart from each other, indicating that this is not just a, you know, not just a, a constricting ring. Um, interestingly, if you go through different stages of gas dilation, the um, tension along the width of the actomyosin band uh, remains relatively constant. It doesn't change too much while the circumferential tension is going up. <coughs> okay. So what we wanted to know is where this tension is coming from and what it really means for the process uh, for force generation and pulling on the margin of the EVR. <coughs> so the next thing we did is we uh, looked at the dynamic distribution of actinomyosin during the formation of the ring and during uh, ring constriction. <coughs> and, um, and what we do is, again, we're looking at this little window over here at a stage where the ring has crossed the equator. And we're looking here at myosin 2 dynamic redistribution, F-actin, and then a merge between myosin 2 and F-actin. And in this movie, what you will see is that there's actually flow. And you see myosin flowing in the opposite direction to the movement of the EVL downwards, right? So you have a retrograde flow of myosin 2. You have, um, in parallel to myosin 2 flow, you have a flow of um, F-actin, and you can very nicely see that these things are flowing in the approximately the same velocity in the opposite direction to the movement of the EVL downwards. So you have a retrograde flow of um, myosin 2 and F-actin in the region where this actomyosin ring uh, becomes apparent, right? And I think this is uh, just a quantification of these flows. <coughs> Positive velocities are velocities which are going down towards the vaginal pole. So the EVL margin moves downwards. This would be the connection between EVL and the yolk cell, and this is actinomyosin within the yolk cell, which are moving in the opposite direction to the margin of the EVR. So you have a retrograde flow of actinomyosin. <coughs> so we uh, teamed up here again. Uh, Stefan was already part of the experimental analysis, but we took Guillaume Salbo, he's a theorist, on board. And um, uh, together with them, uh, we developed uh, two different uh, potential scenarios by which forces could be generated by this actinomyosin band, including these retrograde flows now of actinomyosin. So the first sort of motor activity we assumed is the one which has, had been assumed before already in, in several studies. And that is uh, essentially what we call the cable constriction motor, which means that this actomyosin band predominantly constricts around the circumference. And once it has moved over the equator, it generates a pulling force on the margin and pulls it downwards. The other motor activity at this point is uh, uh, you know, still a speculation, is uh, a flow friction motor. What we assumed here is that um, the, um, there's constriction, there's contraction of the actomyosin band, not only around the circumference, but, but also along, uh, uh, you know, along the width of the actomyosin band. Then assuming that this uh, actomyosin band would be coupled here to, the, to these junctions which connect the EVL to the underlying yolk cell, and it would be more free to constrict uh, on the other end, then you would get a, a net flow, a retrograde flow of actomyosin. You, con you, you contract the network, you couple it on one end, and you only loosely couple it on the other end, then you get a flow which is backwards oriented, right? 
but assuming that this flow would not be completely free, otherwise it would collapse, but it would be resisted by some friction, then you would generate a net force which is pulling in the opposite, opposite direction and pulls the margin downwards. <coughs> so we call it a flow friction motor where you have a contraction of the optimizing band along its width, which in case it is um, resisted by friction to any adjacent structure within the yolk cell, this could be yolk granules, microtubules, anything you, you can imagine which is in there, it would, uh, would, would uh, cause a, a pulling force down us. Okay, this uh, at this point was obviously a pure speculation, and we were looking for experiments how we can distinguish between these two motor activities. And the experiment which we came up, which was originally actually suggested by Peter Schwille, and, and then uh, he, he sort of took it on, um, is the idea that we uh, take the embryo and we put it in a um, agarose capillary and we form the embryo from its uh, original spherical geometry into something which looks like a cylinder. And when we have a cylinder, then we know that this uh, cable constriction motor activity would be rendered inactive because there is no curvature of the embryo and it cannot pull by a cable constriction activity anymore. Okay, so the experiment is this. You take the embryo, you put it in, and then you're asking would the EVL in such a configuration and such a geometry still move downwards? Is there any sort of pulling activity which might be due to a motor activity which is not the cable constriction motor? Let's put it in, in, a, in a very sort of neutral way. That's what the embryo looks like if you're putting it in. They are fine. You can take them out and they, they develop into normal embryos. Excuse me. This is now the, the embryo <coughs> in a capillary uh, at high magnification. You can see the EVL up here, the yolk down here, and um, uh, you can see a bit of actin accumulating here in this, uh, in this margin, which is not, not very uh, obvious here. Now, the, the question is what would happen? And you know, the original assumption was that it would not move, but to our surprise, what was happening is actually that the EVL moved downwards approximately at the same velocity as it would move downwards in, in an in unconstrained, uh, unconstrained embryo here. And you see nice accumulation of actinomycin, and you even have a retrograde flow of actinomycin, indicating that uh, the cable constriction motor activity, which had originally been assumed to be the critical motor activity to pull on the margin of the EVL, is actually dispensable. And you can even generate forces which are sufficient to pull the EVL downwards in cases where this motor activity is not uh, is, is rendered inactive. If that is the flow friction motor activity is still an open question, but we assume since we see these flows that the, the flow friction motor might actually be, be doing the job in this case. That's what the embryos look like at the end of gastrulation, and again, you can take them out and it's all fine. Now, what we concluded on this, and I meant very quickly through it because we, and this is uh, old stuff which we published a few years ago, is that um, that the EVR spreading here is, is driven by uh, two motor presumably two motor activities. One motor activity is the cable constriction motor activity, which you can, which is to a degree dispensable. It doesn't mean that it doesn't work in, in a normal geometry. But uh, if, you, uh, if you render this inactive, there's another motor activity which might likely be a flow friction motor activity, um, which pulls in large and pulls it downwards. OK. So we, I'm, I'm not saying that the cable constriction motor activity is not active. It will contribute but its contribution can be substituted by another motor activity once it's being rendered inactive. OK. Now, what I would like to do then is uh, tell you a bit more about the EVL, how it spreads over the yolk cell. And in particular, what I would like to speak about is um, cell divisions within the EVL and how possibly cell divisions within the EVL contribute to spreading of the EVL over the yolk cell. OK. So, so what, I, what I show you here is uh, the EVL again. You would assume that there is actinomycin accumulating in this marginal region already, and you know the EVL starts to spread. And what I have visualized in this movie, I, Pedro, who, is, uh, who was doing these ex experiments here, are all cell divisions happening within the ER. And um, you, you know that there are a number of EVL cells undergoing divisions. And they are dividing at pretty much random places within the EVL. There's a slight bias initially to the animal pole, but um, eventually cells dividing at every place. Cell divisions are becoming more rare during the course of epiphyly, and most of the cell divisions are happening before the EVL has actually reached the equator. Once it crosses the equator, the, the frequency of divisions are going down. But what we noted by uh, these divisions is not only their frequency at, at, at certain stages of EVL epiphyly and uh, their spatial uh, distribution within the EVL, but we also noted that these um, divisions seem mm -hmm. to be preferentially oriented along the animal vegetal axis. And you know, just stop the movie now. It's perhaps not the most representative picture, but you can see these two daughter cells being aligned along the animal vegetal axis. 
these two have a slight tendency, this perhaps less and these two not. But if overall, if you look at the orientation of cell divisions, there is a preferential orientation along the animal vegetal axis of the, of the embryo. So the daughter cells are being placed along the animal vegetal axis, which is the movement axis of the EVL downwards. So we asked two questions uh, based on these observations. First of all, how is EVL cell division orientation being controlled within the EVL? And the second one, which is probably the most important one, is what is the function of oriented cell divisions in EVL tissue spreading during epiphany, if there's any function at all, right? I should say one, one thing about these um, um, divisions within the EVL, these, um, um, you know, th this is not growth. It doesn't, um, you know, the volume of the, the total volume of the EVL is not changing during the process of EVL epiphany movements. So, so once the EVL is being specified and there are no, new, um, no cells joining the EVL anymore, any division of an EVL cell is just subdividing the volume in two parts, right? There's no volume increase, no growth involved. So the only thing we are seeing here is basically a redistribution of the original volume of the dividing cells in a specific spatial configuration. Okay, so no growth. Okay, so, so the first question is, how is EVL cell division orientation controlled? And what we hypothesized here is based on studies which um, have been pioneered by uh, Mathieu Piel in, in um, the Institute of Korea in, in France, Paris. <coughs> and what uh, Mathieu did is he uh, did an experiment where he took a single cell and then he stretched the cell um, along a main axis of tension, and then he asked how would the mitotic spindle be oriented in response to tension applied to these cells. So he did it in culture cells and single culture cells, and what he found is that the main axis of tension determines the orientation of the mitotic spindle. Now, the most simple explanation would be in such cases that the mitotic spindle, that's known for more than 100 years, tries to find the longest axis of these cells, right? And once you are applying stress on a cell, then it will elongate along the main axis of tension, and then the mitotic spindle falls into the main axis, axis of tension. What he then did um, in, in this study, which, which was published a few years ago, is he um, originally grew the cell on, on um, pattern substrate so that, um, that they have a morphology which is actually slightly elongated. And then he pulls them into a more round morphology by an ectopic tension axis. So the morphology where ectopic tension is being applied is actually not elongated along the main tension axis. And then he was asking, would the mitotic spindle still find tension irrespective of the morphology of any sort of preferential elongation along the main tension axis. And he still finds evidence that the mitotic spindle goes along the main tension axis. Now, what he attributes that to is that the, the cell undergoes a slight mitotic rounding, and mitotic rounding leads to retraction fibers. And re the retraction fiber and actin accumulation close to the retraction fibers is usually along the main tension axis. So tension triggers actin accumulation of the actomyosin cortex along the main tension axis, and this accumulation of actin leads to a prefer preferential anchoring of the mitotic spindle along the main tension axis. So somehow tension modulates the actomyosin cortex in a polarized manner, and this leads to anchoring of the spindle along the main tension axis. So it's a mechanism which is independent of shape. That's what he proposed. Okay. Based on, 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 on his experiments, we thought, you know, anisotropic tissue tension within the EVL might in, indeed be responsible for orienting uh, the mitotic spindle and leads to this preferential orientation of EVL cell divisions within the EVL. Now, the experiments we did here are very similar to the experiments I showed you before. Now, we are just looking at the EVL. We are not looking at the York cell down here. And we are doing two cuts, and uh, uh, cuts in two orientations. One, one cut is parallel to the margin of the EVL which would reveal tension along the animal vegetal axis of the EVR. And we do uh, cuts which are perpendicular to the margin of the EVR, which should reveal circumferential te tension um, uh, within the EVR. We did these cuts at different stages of EVR, probably, and at different positions within the EVR. And in a very short, uh, I just summarized that, that the uh, stage, I will show you dependency on stage. There's no dependency on the position. Other if, you know, of course, if you go to the animal pole, you don't have any, the orientation doesn't count anymore. But um, it doesn't matter where you do these cuts, here, here, or here, you would get approximately the same ratio of, of tension distribution. <laughs> okay. Now, that's what he got is when he did these cuts. Is, um, uh, this is the quantification over here, different stages of EVA pivoting movements. And the perpendicular cuts are the ones which are revealing circumferential tension, and the parallel cuts are the ones which are uh, revealing tension along the animal vegetal axis. If you compare now the, the red to the uh, green bars here, you can see that from 50% uh, down to 80%, there is a tension anisotropy, where the main axis of tension is indeed along the animal vegetal axis, revealed by the green cuts here, 
and the minor axis of tangent is around the circumference. So once the EVL has moved over the equator, there is anisotropic tangent building up within the EVL, which could be in principle consistent with the assumption that the orientation of the mitotic spindle and the placement of the daughter cells depends on the main axis, that depends on tension anisotropy within the EVL. That's, <coughs> excuse me, that's obviously a, 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 a hypothesis which you could experimentally address uh, function in the interdependency. Now the experiment which uh, Pedro came up, which is a very uh, simple experiment to see if tension within the EVL can indeed orient the mitotic spindle is an experiment where he looks at a cell within the EVL at 60-70% epiboly, and this is now an EVL cell which is about to divide. And what he has marked now in, in, in white is the orientation of the mitotic spindle which is already visible in this dividing cell. So the mitotic spindle has found its, uh, you know, its position where it wants to be, and now what he's doing is he's inducing an atopic tension axis within the EVL by doing a little trick. He's using a laser and he's ablating a few cells up here and a few cells down here. Once he's ablating these cells, the cells are being extruded, you get wound healing, and what you have is a lot of stretching between these two points of ablation which lead to um, tension building up between these two points of, of ablation. This is a very strong ectopic tension axis within the EVL. And he's positioning now these ablations in a way that the, the tension axis would be perpendicular to the original position of the mitotic spindle. And he wants to see if he can reposition the mitotic spindle now to this new main tension axis within the EVL he is inducing, to see if anisotropic tension can reorient the mitotic spindle within the EVL. Okay? So, so now that's the experiment. Uh, he's ablating a cell over here, a cell down here, and you can very nicely see that uh, the mitotic spindle now finds the new tension axis which he has induced between the two points of the patient. Okay? So, so that's um, direct proof that um, anisotropic tension influences the positioning of the mitotic spindle. Perhaps I should uh, say a few more words about the mechanism because I don't have slides in here, but um, one thing you can already see is if you look at this cell that it is elongated, right? And you could assume that one of the mechanisms, and that's something we are certainly supporting, is that the main tension axis leads to a preferential or elongation of, uh, of EVL cells, and that this elongation leads then to a preferential uh, positioning of the mitotic spindle, right? So that's a likely mechanism. We are not excluding it. We also wanted to know if um, perhaps the accumulation or the activity of actin and myosin and potentially the asymmetric accumulation of actin and myosin, um, consistent with the idea from Mati Piel, uh, in response to, to uh, tension distribution within the EVL might have an influence on the mitotic spindle positioning. So the experiment, which I unfortunately don't have the slides in here, where that we inhibited myosin-2 activity partially, inhibited myosin-2 activity within the EVL, we were asking would in such an experiment, the mitotic spindle still find the, the, the main axis of tension, which we have induced independently of myosin-2, right? And what we find is evidence that in cases where myosin-2 activity is partially inhibited, the mitotic spindle would not find very easily the longest axis of these cells anymore, indicating that myosin-2 activity is required. We are not saying it's you know, asymmetric distribution of myosin-2 activity, but myosin-2, presumably actomyosin contraction, is required for correct positioning of the mitotic spindle in response to tension. What we don't have evidence yet for is whether actin or myosin would now preferentially accumulate at these poles of the cells and if that would lead to a preferential anchoring of the mitotic spindle. That's something we don't know. We have not found any evidence for that yet. The only thing which, we've, uh, we, which we found is that's quite interesting. If you look at the apex, so the surface of these cells, and you look at myosin, Myosin um, is present in myosin minifilaments, and the orientation of myosin mini minifilaments is along the main axis of tension. So if you look at these min minifilaments, they align along the main axis of tension. If that has any influence on the positioning of the mitotic spindle, we don't know. Sorry? Yeah. I, I come to that. I have one experiment where we quantified that. Yeah. Because, I mean, that would be an important experiment if we indeed to actually induce uh, an anisotropic tension in this experiment. We assume we do, but. Is it really, is it actually in the range of what the embryo shows or not? I'll show you, show you evidence for that. Okay, this is just a quantification of the experiments I showed you here that in, in, in a control experiment, the mitotic spindle is always where it was before at 90 degrees to the ectopic tension axis. And once you are uh, inducing an ectopic tension axis, you can be on the mitotic spindle. 
Now, but the, um, in the, just in a summary up to here, what we propose here is that there's anisotropic tension building up within the EVL during its movement downwards, uh, leading to a main tension axis along the animal vegetal axis. This anisotropic, anisotropic tension within the EVL leads to a stereotypical cell division orientation in the EVL. <coughs> now, the, um, huh, did I, uh, let me see if that's still in there. Yeah, it should be in there, so. Okay, so, so about the, Yeah, yeah. No, you don't. Um, so, so what you, you might initially release tension because you, you get a little opening, but then what you have is a wound healing. You extrude the cells which you have ablated, right? So you reduce area here and you reduce area here, and then you stretch the tissue in between, right? So initially, <coughs> directly after the cut, you might release tension, but then cells are being extruded. And then you heal that. You have a little wound healing ring, and then you uh, you stretch the tissue. Yeah. Ah, so it's still in the embryos and then spindle orientation. Yes. Um, yeah, we have done experiments. Perhaps I can come back to that at the end of the talk because I show you. Well. Sure, if I show you, but you know, perhaps I go through the functional evidence and then I come back to your question because I'm that's a relevant one. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you what we have done along that, but before I have to tell you what we what we did on the functional. <laughs> okay, so what what's the function of tendon oriented cell division in EVL tissue spreading during epithelium? And um, what we assumed is that tendon oriented cell divisions might reduce tension anisotropy within the tissue, and by reducing tension anisotropy, they, they might be facilitate tissue spreading. So the idea would be that um, what you have is you have cells cleaving, and then you're positioning the two daughter cells along the main axis of tension, which would be equivalent to an elongation of the cell along the main axis of tension, right? Because the volume is not changing, but you're positioning the two daughter cells in a specific uh, uh, spatial arrangement, which would be equivalent to an elongation. So you preferentially elongate cells along the main axis of tension, which should lead to a tension release along the main axis of tension, and which should then reduce tension anisotropy within the tissue. And that potentially could facilitate EVL activity spreading. That was the idea we had um, on a possible function of EVL spreading. Now the experiment, and that comes back to one question I forgot some, some of you. <coughs> Do we actually have tension along this axis here? So what we did is we uh, ablate a few cells up here, cells down here, and then we're doing a cut we reveal tension which is being built up between these two points. We do it in two different uh, conditions. In one condition <clears throat> where there's no cell dividing in between, and in another condition where there's one cell uh, undergoing an oriented division, right? And the question is, would tension be reduced in response to having an oriented cell division between these two points? Again, this is not growth. It's just an oriented cell division. The volume is not changing. So would uh, the tension recorded in the absence of a cell division the same as the tension in the presence of a cell division? It's a very simple experiment. You can do that. And I mean, you see recoil here, and you see recoil here. It doesn't tell you not too much, but <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, uh, um, <coughs> the recoil velocity. Um, if you compare now the recoil velocity in cases where you have no division to cases where you have one cell, which is during, before the experiment actually is done, has under, is undergoing a division, then you see that tension is being reduced in the presence of a division compared to cases where there's no division. Indicating that this assumed function of the oriented division reducing tension as anisotropy is actually um, a realistic one, at least at the time scale of this experiment here. I should go over that. And then the <coughs> sort of functional experiment we did here is, is doing um, uh, two functional experiments. We thought we can either uh, inhibit cell divisions completely, or we can randomize cell division orientation. In both of these cases, we would assume that tension anisotropy is not being reduced as efficiently as in white embryo, and potentially EVL epibly movements are being uh, um, uh, impaired. Right? I mean, that was the assumption we had originally, and, the, and these are the experiments you can already see. In cases where we inhibit cell divisions, or in cases where we randomize cell division orientation by injecting an antibody against dynein, which inhibits dynein function, and dynein is required for coupling the metodic spindle to the uh, um, actomizing cortex, 
In this case, we know, in this case, that we very efficiently inhibit cell divisions in the, within the EVL. In this case, we randomize cell division orientation. In both of these cases, the take home message is hardly anything happens. So the EVL moves downwards at the same velocity and at the same efficiency, roughly, uh, as you would see in a wild type embryo. So we thought that's sort of you know, the end of the project, which just tells us that oriented cell divisions do happen within the EVL. They are being induced by anisotropic tension within the EVL, but apparently they are dispensable. You can get rid of them, and the EVL is doing fine. OK. Until the point where Pedro was looking at movies of the EVL in cases where he inhibited cell divisions or in cases where he randomized cell division orientation. He made a very interesting observation, which he didn't anticipate before, and just look. I think between these two cells here, now this is an embryo in which he has inhibited cell divisions. What he noted is that instead of having cell divisions, what you get is cell fusions within the EVL. So you have two cells which are fusing within the plane of the EVL. That's something you would see in a wild type embryo, embryo very rarely to not at all, actually. So you get very, very, you know, very infrequently you get fusion of cells. Now in cases when he's, <clears throat> when he's inhibiting cell divisions or when he's randomizing cell division orientation, he gets a very large increase in the uh, uh, frequency of these cell fusion events uh, um, within the embryo. Now the question is, uh, what he speculated at this stage is what these fusions might do. There might actually be a compensatory mechanism which is being activated in an epithelium in which oriented cell divisions are being uh, impaired. So, so potentially what, what he was speculating is that um, you, get, uh, you, know, you get an oriented cell division, uh, oriented release of tension during the fusion process. Okay? And the, the idea is, uh, if you look at these two cells, which are about to fuse this, that uh, once these cells are fusing, they are um, elongating the, the common uh, boundary between these two cells very rapidly, and eventually this boundary is collapsing and the cells are fusing. So what you do is you get release of tension along this orientation here, which is perpendicular to the orientation of fusion. Okay, so that was his idea, and he wanted to see if that is actually, uh, you know, an, a plausible idea. So what he did is he looked at the dynamics of um, junction boundary uh, extension between two cells which are about to fuse versus two cells randomly two cells which are not fusing, right? Just to see if the uh, dynamics of uh, um, junction shrinkage and extension are different between these two scenarios. And he finds that the junction growth rate is significantly higher in cases where cells are fusing versus cases where cells are not fusing. And he's done many cases and compared that. So, so what he came up, um, and you know, what I still think is a plausible assumption, is that you have two mechanisms within the MDO which could potentially reduce tension anisotropy and could facilitate EVL spreading. One mechanism would be that EVL cells are undergoing divisions, and that the two daughter cells are being placed along the main axis of tension, which is uh, equivalent to an elongation of the mother cell here, and that would release tension and would release tension on isotopy and facilitate spreading. And if this mechanism is defective, you might activate a second mechanism, which is a fusion of cells. And in the fusion event, again, you have two cells which are fusing along this orientation and release tension along this orientation by ending up with cells. This is a very simplistic diagram, of course but it would intuitively tell you what the, uh, what the underlying model is here. OK, so just to summarize, uh, up to here, what we, what we are speculating um, is that there's actomyosin plant mediated pulling forces, which pull on the march and pull it downwards. This leads to a buildup of anisotropic tissue tension within the EVR, where the main tension axis is along the animal vegetal axis and the minor axis around the circumference. In response to this, Anisotropic tension cells are preferentially elongating along the main axis of tension, but there might also be a, an actomyosin independent process, which is independent of cell shape, which leads to positioning, preferential positioning of the daughter cells along the main axis of tension. So you have a stereotypical cell division orientation. Yes? Say it again. So, so if the cells are fusing, would they be white again? Ah, would they be white again? Um, <coughs> that's a bit, well, I mean, in cases where we have suppressed cell division, they would not divide again. In cases where we have randomized cell division orientation, the fused cells, I think, in most cases, well, in all cases we have seen, are actually not dividing. But the problem is that cell fusions, that the frequency of divisions goes down over the course of epiphyly. 
and they are only very, very infrequently dividing at the end of uh, gastrulation. And once we have seen the fusing cells, we already, you know, ways to gastrulation. So it's hard to find actually cell divisions uh, still happening within the EDL to, to test this. Uh, you know, if you have a binucleated cell, and the question would be, would that be able to divide? And we, we don't have a good answer for that. The, the, these cells are still functional. They are staying on the surface of the embryo. And the, the good thing about the EVL is the embryo doesn't need the EVL at later stages. It's just shedding it off and uh, gets rid of it. So it's not an, an, you know, it's not an indispensable structure for long in development. Uh, <clears throat> Um, so, so you're asking if more than two cells are fusing together? <laughs> yeah. So that comes back to the experiment where we did the cylindrical embryos. What we did is actually we tried to do cylindrical embryos to at least transiently build up tension by changing the surface to, to volume ratio in these embryos, and then to see if you can actually induce fusions of cells. Um, we have no way to see if we are changing the anisotropic an anisotropy of tension within the EVL because once we are putting them into little agarose uh, capillaries, we can't really do cuts, CV laser cuts, so we cannot uh, reveal tension within it. But what we observed is when we are taking these cells out again, that we are inducing a massive amount of fusion of cells, even in wild-type embryos in which cell divisions are. So if we transiently, presumably, increase in-plane tension within the EVL, we can, we can uh, trigger fusion of cells and also of multiple cells together. So we have very large patches of EVL which contain multiple nuclei in such cases. The, the sort of the, the downside of this experiment is that we can actually not look at tension within the EVL anymore. So we assume that there's more tension. Than that. Okay, so, so importantly in this model is that there's an um, uh, equilibrium between anisotropic tension and stereotypical cell division orientation, which keep uh, sort of an equilibrium where, you know, there's a, a certain degree of tension anisotropy keeping uh, the divisions uh, um, oriented along the main axis of tension. And once you inactivate this mechanism, you might activate another mechanism, a combinatory mechanism, which might be EVL cell fusion. I should say one more word about EVL cell fusion. You might have noted that the, the number of fusions is much lower than the number of divisions, which already indicates that fusion cannot be the only compensatory mechanism, because you, you would assume that at least the numbers would you know, roughly match between these two events, but they are not. So the, uh, fusions are much more infrequent than, than divisions, indicating that fusion is only one potential compensatory mechanism. Which we have OK. <coughs> Ah, okay. So, I mean, they, they, yeah. I think there's good ex there's there's good evidence from particularly from Drosophila work that tension in plane tension is not only determining the orientation of divisions but also the frequency of divisions. By um, you know, if you have very dense tissues and you release tension within the tissue. Then you know you activate, I think, uh, uh, hypocycling, and you know you you get TAS out of the nucleus, you have TAS out of the nucleus, and you don't get divisions anymore. So there, there's a the, the activating of the cell division program is tension independent via certain biochemical signaling pathways like the hypocycling pathway. Um, in our case, we know that the hypocycling pathway is actually on in these cells and the EVR cells. We know that TAS and YAP go in a tension dependent manner into the nucleus. So they are mechanical sensing. But the frequency of cell divisions within the EVL is not tension dependent. The frequency seems to be a de developmental program which runs in these cells, and they have loads of divisions at early stages of EVL differentiation and very little divisions at later stages. No ten tension dependency in this case. There, there's one tension dependency which is quite interesting. I didn't put these slides in here. <clears throat> As I indicated, YAP TAS, you probably have heard about it. These are uh, transcription activators, co, -co activators. And what had been shown before is that tension can regulate the uh, nuclear localization of these transcriptional activators, YAP and TAS. What we noted is that when tension builds up within the EDL, TAS, one of these two activators, goes in a tension-dependent manner into the nucleus. And once it is in the nucleus, it activates the differentiation of these cells and the ability of these cells to undergo squamous spreading. Um, in mutants for TAS, in maternal syngotic mutants for TAS, EVL specification and EVL epiboly is strongly affected, indicating that there is a mechanosensitive process going on in these cells, which in our case is not 
the rate of cell division is called cell phase specification and the ability of cells to undergo spreading. <coughs> okay, so time wise, uh, how much time do I have? Probably not. Okay, so I can tell you a bit about um, the interaction now between EVL spreading, which would be on the outside here, and what the deep cells are doing. Because, you know, what we did is now we exclusively looked at the surface of the embryo, but obviously the surface is not working independently of what, what happens uh, below, right? And, you know, the, the really interesting question was, you know, how would these two processes, rearrangement of deep cells and spreading of surface cells, be coordinated in space and time during the spreading process? Okay. So I just show you what we did is here we looked at a very early stage of EVL spreading and deep cell uh, rearrangement, a process which is called zebrafish doming. And you will see why it is called doming. Now that's the embryo, and you will see that it appears as if the yolk moves into the blastoderm, but in fact what is happening, the blastoderm starts to spread around the yolk, right? So this process, it's a very simple process, and you know, um, you, you, you might think you can understand that straight away, but um, but what you have is what this process involves is, you know, you, you extend, you expand the surface here, and you have a lot of rearrangement of deep cells in this process of, of doming, right? <coughs> so, um, okay, so, so doming in, in zebrafish, again, is a process, a morphogenetic process, which has been looked, looked, on for, looked at for many years already, and two different potentially force-generating mechanisms have been implicated in doming. One is the one which I indicated before is radial intercalation of deep cells. And you know, here I'm saying active radial intercalation of deep cells, meaning that cells are actively moving along the radial axis, undergoing intercalation along the radial axis, thereby thinning the, um, the axis along its radial extent and expanding the, the tissue along its remaining two axes. Okay. So, so the driving force being cells actively moving along the radial axis, undergoing radial intercalation, and then leading to a deformation of the tissue thinning of the tissue along its radial axis and then spread. And uh, that has been, you know, proposed in a number of publications. I just put the most recent in here. There was another study, which is now more than uh, 10 years ago, um, and it was not really, uh, you know, noted much in the community, is that they um, suggested that what you're seeing here is actually the result of the York cell actively pushing into the blastoderm. So they are speculating that the tissue which is spreading is passively deformed by a pushing force which comes from the yolk cell and pushes into the cluster down. And we found both of these ideas quite attractive and, you know, that's something we can actually experimentally address. So, so again, in this case, we teamed up with Guillaume to um, first uh, uh, build a very simple uh, mechanical model of um, how spreading of um, the tissue could be achieved. And again, it's a model which is based on the balance of interfacial tensions. Um, maybe assuming that the blastoderm has a surface tension, Tb, the yolk cell has a surface tension, which is Ty, and then you have an interfacial tension between the blastoderm and the yolk cell, which we call Tbyi, the, the blastoderm to yolk cell interface. Okay? And now the, what, we, what we postulate is that the specific geometry of the embryo during the doming process is given by the uh, distribution of interfacial tension at each stage during the doming process. We're looking at steady state, where the change would not, where the embryo would not undergo any shape change, and we assume that the balance of these interfacial tensions uh, would give you uh, the specific geometry. Now, in this phase diagram over here, what we have plotted is the ratio of surface tension of the blastoderm to surface tension of the yolk cell on this axis here, and the ratio of interfacial tension between the blastoderm and the yolk cell to the inter uh, to surface tension of the yolk cell on the, uh, along this axis. If you look at that, you can get embryos which look a bit like a doming embryo in this region down here, right? Everything up here is basically unre unrealistic because these embryos are not undergoing doming. But in this case, you achieve a geometry where um, embryos could, in principle, um, you know, look like an embryo at the onset of doming. Now, if you're in this region, you have to assume that the blastoderm tension is um, smaller than the tension of the yolk cell and that this interfacial tension here uh, between the blastoderm and the yolk cell is much smaller than the uh, surface tension of the yolk cell, right? So we wanted to see if that is, you know, that's a prediction from this, you know, very simple uh, uh, um, uh, interfacial tension-driven model, and we wanted to see if we can experimentally actually address that. Now, the experiment we did here is um, an experiment which uh, Guillaume suggested, and uh, we thought it's going to be very simple, but it took us more than a year to do. It's taken an embryo between two plates, and then deforming it along its, you know, um, animal vaginal extent. Then looking at the deformation of the blastoderm at the upper plate 
and the deformation of the yolk cell at the lower plate is a function of force which is being applied onto the embryo, right? And the contact angle and the area of compression here, the, the contact area and the contact area down here and the, uh, the contact angle to tell you something about uh, the surface tensions uh, at the blastoderm versus the surface tension of the yolk cell. During the process of doping, you can do that, right? What you have to incorporate here in this model, and that, that's something you realized only over time, is gravitational forces. That this, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the yolk cell down here, already deforms without any compression. Okay, now that's the experiment. We are putting the embryo together, and then we're waiting, and uh, we're recording the force till it goes into equilibrium. And once this is in equilibrium, which takes quite a while, then we can go and measure uh, the contact area up here, the contact area down here, and the contact angles. <coughs> and derive then the uh, respective surface tension. Now, we did these experiments in quite a few embryos and incorporating then eventually the gravitational forces um, led us to uh, um, results which um, indicate that uh, indeed the uh, surface tension of the blastoderm during the process of doming becomes smaller than the surface tension of the yoxa. This is now not what has been experimentally determined, but this is the prediction from the geometry of the actual embryo on the distribution of interfacial tensions, right? So this is a prediction based on morphology of embryos, but if you're measuring, you're getting to a value which is very close to one and smaller than one as well, okay? So our experimental observations match this point which we predict from the geometry in, in the framework of this theory here. So we get a quite close match between experimental observations and the theoretical predictions. Okay, <clears throat> so, so what we wanted to know is then, you know, how is the blastoderm reducing its surface tension, and is that the only mechanism by which doming is being uh, 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 um, triggered? So what we, what we speculated, there are two potential force generating processes. One would be a reduction in blastoderm surface tension by EVL expansion. So the EVL could actively expand, and by actively expand, as expanding it could reduce the surface tension of the blastoderm. But we also wanted to see if the generation of radius stress within the blastoderm the active radius interclation could contribute to this process. We, we didn't want to exclude the original assumption that you know, there is active stress generation within the blastoderm, which leads to spreading of the blastoderm, right? So this would be the mechanism which we you know, sort of addressed in, in, in this very simplistic model of interfacial tensions. And this would be an alternative mechanism which has been uh, um, proposed in, in previous studies on, on this topic here. Now, what, we, what do we have to put in in this dynamic model of doming, then? We have to put in the surface tension of the blastoderm, the yoxa. That's something we can measure, which I showed you in the previous experiment. We have to put in the viscosities of the blastoderm, the yoxa, and that's a bit harder to measure. And what we did is we essentially took, to measure the viscosity, we took pieces of the blastoderm. Um, we, we took the blastoderm, we cut it into two pieces, and then let the, these two pieces of blastoderm fuse over time. By the relaxation and the fusion time, we can, we can de uh, deduce the viscosity of these tissues. And we did the same for the blastoderm as, as we did for the yolk cell to, to arrive at viscosities of these two tissues here, which you can put into the model. And then we, what we ideally would like to know is the interfacial tension between the blastoderm and the yolk cell, this interfacial tension at the blastoderm to yolk cell interface. That's something we cannot experimentally obtain, and we have to fit this value to the uh, morph morphology at the end. And the radius stress within the blastoderm, again, is something we assume, but we have to fit uh, because we, we cannot measure it currently directly. Okay, um, I'll just show you this one experiment here where we, <coughs> where we have two ways of measuring um, the viscosity of tissues. In this case, we take a blastoderm tissue, we compress it, then we relieve the upper plate and we look how quick the, um, the, the tissue um, regains its spherical geometry, relaxation. And here we are taking two tissues of blastoderm, we are fusing them at the middle, and then we ask how quick they round up again. In those cases, you would, you would get a readout for viscosity. We, did, we also did one experiment to learn something very roughly about the interfacial tension between um, the blastoderm and the yolk cell. And what we saw is that perhaps the amount of actinomycin localizing at this interface might give us some idea about um, at, at least the extent by which tension would change at this interface, right? And you know, and that's very, very indirect. But what we see is that there's very little change in the localization of actinomycin at the interface between the blastoderm and yolk cell, suggesting that this this tension at least that's something we can sort of propose is not changing during the course of activity. How big it is, we cannot say. Particularly, we cannot say that it is much smaller than the uh, uh, interfacial tension of the yolk cell. You, you might remember from the phase diagram, that's, that's a prediction from the model. Okay, now that's what we put into this dynamic model, and then we uh, did first the simulation 
which is only based on the assumption that uh, what is happening during gastrulation is, during doming is that uh, EV ulcers are actively expanding and reducing the surface tension of the gastrula. Right? That would be you know, one mechanism. We're exclusively looking at this mechanism now, and um, that's what you're getting in a simulation. You get an embryo which looks like an embryo which is undergoing doming, but really not. I mean, if you look now at this uh, triple point here, in particular at, at this region down here, that doesn't really look like an embryo which is undergoing doming. So that already suggests that you know, the assumption that is only active expansion of surface cells might not hold true. I mean, at least you know, based on these simulations now. So we are not putting in any radial stress generation within the plasma. Now we did also a simulation where we only assume that the, you know, what is happening in the embryo is radial stress generation, but there's no active expansion of the EVL, right? I mean, what, whatever expands on the surface of the EVL is passive, but there's no active expansion of the EVL cells. Right, I mean, the only thing which is happening is active stress generation. And to our surprise, initially, you know, when you, when you look at these simulations, that looked look much more realistic to what is happening during doming um, in comparison to the simulations I showed you before, right? So, so we, we sort of arrived from these, so based on these two types of simulations, that active stress, radio stress generation within the blastoderm seems to be a more plausible mechanism which triggers doming compared to this reduction of surface tension. So, we were not entirely sure how we, um, you know, put the, you know, our experimental observations now together with the uh, theoretical prediction. What we wanted to know is we wanted to do experiments where we can actually interfere with, with these two different processes. One would be active radius stress generation within the blastoderm, and the other one would be active spreading of EVL cells. Now, experimentally, we can address these two things, and this is an experiment Hitoshi came up, which is a tricky experiment um, to do. But he, he took an embryo at the onset of doming, so no doming has happened. And then he wants to take out most of the deep cells and replace the deep cells with buffer. I mean, you change viscosity, but we can discuss it later. But essentially what you do is you reduce the amount of deep cells, and thereby you reduce the amount of radius stress generation which can happen within the cluster. And he was assuming when he has an embryo which is consisting only of a York cell and EVL and then a few cells in between, that he would look at a scenario where radius stress generation is being very strongly inhibited in the embryo, and he would not see any doming, right? Because if, you know, from the theoretical predictions, we thought that radius stress generation is going to be um, the main driving force. Now, that's what is happening, and that was really surprising. If you look at this embryo, doming seems to be completely fine, right? Look over here. It's all okay. So even in the absence of, uh, you know, a large amount of cells between the EVL and the York cell, the embryo can undergo doming. And that, again, indicates that radius stress generation, or at least a large part of radius stress generation within the blastoderm, is dispensable for uh, the embryo undergoing doming. Okay, so that was quite surprising. So we, we wanted to see if we can address now to, to see, you know, what is the contribution of active surface cell expansion. And um, these are experiments which, um, where we took advantage of a mutant embryo, and this mutant embryo, is a, it's called... It has a name, it's called Koki, and in what is happening in these mutant embryos is a mutant in a gene which is called IKK1. And IKK1 is a part of the NF kappa B signaling pathway. It's just as a background information. What is happening in this embryo is that the surface cells, these EDR cells, are not undergoing differentiation. And because they are not undergoing differentiation, they cannot actively spread anymore. These cells are remaining relatively small and they are not undergoing, they are not becoming really squamous epithelial cells, right? So we can take advantage of these mutant tissues and now doing transplantation experiments to see if we have mutant cells which are unable to expand, would we still get doming in embryos, right? I mean, the first thing he did is he took a mutant embryo and asked, would this mutant embryo actually undergo doming? That had been noted before already that this embryo is not doming whatsoever. Eventually, it actually collapses and, and dies. So in the absence of, in the complete absence of EVR spreading, doming is very strongly uh, being inhibited. Just a uh, quantification where we're looking at the Bieber eye surface, this surface area as a function of time during the doming process. There's hardly any change in, in these mutant embryos, and there is an increase in wild type embryos. <coughs> now, the, the real experiments we wanted to do is um, now doing transplantation experiment. That's, you know, it's, uh, it looks relatively simple, but it's a complicated experiment. And what he did is he um, did two types of experiments. He takes now mutant surface cells from a mutant embryo, which are unable to uh, expand. And then he, he, he replaces a patch of wild-type surface cells with a patch of mutant surface cells. Now he has an embryo, 
which is a mosaic embryo, which is largely, which is widely wild type, but contains a little patch of mutant surface cells which cannot expand. And he's asking, would that be able to uh, interfere with stomy movements in an otherwise wild type embryo? So you assume radius stress generation is fine, everything is fine, just these cells up here cannot expand. Okay, and then you can do the, the uh, reverse experiment, and you can put wild type cells, which are expansion competent, and put it on an otherwise mutant embryo and see if you can actually rescue doming in a mutant embryo. Okay, now the, the first experiment is the one which I just indicated. He has a mutant embryo, which usually would not undergo doming. He puts these wild type surface cells onto the mutant embryo up here, and then he's asking, would he be able to rescue doming? Now that's what happens. You get spreading up here, and whoop, you get a little dome forming right below the transplanted cells. So once you're putting only a patch of surface cells which can actively expand, you can locally rescue uh, the uh, uh, upward bulging of this interface here, which is indicative of doming. And that's just a quantification to convince you in a pokey mutant, this is a mutant embryo, and without transplanted cells, there's hardly anything happening once you're putting these trans transplanted cells in to get a local rescue of doming. <coughs> okay. You can do the reverse experiment by putting now mutant cells onto a wild type embryo. Now, this wild type embryo usually forms a perfect dome, as wild type embryos do. And you're putting a, a patch of mutant cells up here, and these cells are unable to properly expand, act actively expand, right? They're just staying small, remaining small cells. And if he looks at these embryos, you can see that doming is partially suppressed right below the transplanted cells where, uh, where, where the transplantation has taken place, indicating that there's an inhibitory influence of these surface cells on doming movements. Yeah, very clear evidence, and again, if you look at the quantification, this effect is partially transient, but you know, there's at least at this stage is doing uh, doming. There's a clear inhibition of the efficiency of undergoing doming below uh, cells which are unable to expand. Now, there, in, in, if, you, if you do transplantations between mutant and wild-type embryos, there's always a discussion about what you're actually interfering in. You can take mutant cells and be assuming that the main defect in mutant cells is that they are unable to expand. But you could argue mutant cells are not only unable to expand, but they are not secreting and chemoattractant, and they you know, might do many different things or might be unable to do many different things which a wild-type cell would do. So can we do an experiment where we specifically interfere only with uh, the ability of surface cells to expand irrespective of their specific genetic background or a mutation where we don't know what, is, what exactly is being affected in them. Now, we, we did uh, three different experiments I show you to address that. In the first experiment, we are taking wild-type wild surface cells, and we are overexpressing a form of the uh, small uh, row, GTPS row A, which increases actomyosin contractility in these cells, and which interferes with the ability of surface cells to expand. So these cells are otherwise wild-type, but they are overactivating um, row A, overactivating, uh, leading to activation of myosin 2, and they you know, impair their ability to undergo spreading. OK, so, so what is happening in such a case, again, you get a local reduction of doming right below the patch of Ray overexpressing cells. This effect, again, is transient, and you can see it nicely here. And eventually, they're catching up, but um, um, there's a clear, recognizable, and consistent effect on the ability to, um, of this interface to deform in response to that dis to inability of surface cells to expand. We can do the opposite experiment, and now doing a transplantation between two mutant tissues. We are taking mutant surface cells. We're expressing now on the mutant surface cells amyosin phosphatase. And by expressing amyosin phosphatase, we reduce actomyosin contraction in these surface cells, and we increase the ability to undergo spreading. Okay. Now, this is the experiment we are taking myosin phosphatase overexpressing surface cells and putting it onto a mutant embryo and asked could be possibly rescue doming in this homotypic transplantation experiment. And again, you see that there's a dome forming right below the patch of transplanted cells over here, indicating that by only affecting my actomizing contraction in these cells, keeping the genotype constant, you can, um, you can affect doming in these embryos. And again, that's the quantification of it. Now, the last experiment was the most tricky one where, you know, where we discussed we want to do an experiment where we are leaving, you know, we are not interfering with any gene function in, in these cells. And the only thing we want to do is changing the surface area locally. Now, the experiment he did here is taking a very large patch of mutant surface cells and replacing a smaller patch of mutant surface cells with this large patch here. So he's just increasing locally and transiently the surface area um, um, at the transplantation site. The genotype is exactly the same, and he's asking, would that rescue domain? 
And that's what is happening. He gets a local rescue of dormant. Eventually, the embryo collapses and dies. But there's a recognizable effect and consistent effect he finds here. <coughs> and I think that really um, um, was clear evidence that what triggers doming is the ability of surface cells to undergo spreading, and an increase, a local active increase in surface area. Now, be, be, there was one difficulty in these experiments, which we noted at the end of the transplantation experiments in discussions with Guillaume about um, the potential contribution is that what we find in these experiments, we are putting, for example, mutant cells onto a wild type, or where we are putting wild cells onto a mutant embryo, that the effects on the deformation of this interface are rather local. So we see a local inhibition of doming, and we see a local rescue of doming. That is something you would not necessarily assume, because in these transplantation experiments, what you do is you put cells which are either uh, unable to expand or which are competent to expand onto uh, the other genotype. But what you would assume is you globally change surface tension of the placenta eventually, because these cells are making contacts to the, to the uh, surrounding cells. They should globally change surface tension, not locally. If you change globally surface tension, you should have a global effect on, on, on this interface here as well. But you get a very local effect. And that, and that was a problem, because that would not be what we would predict from simulation. If you globally change surface tension, you globally change this interface. We don't get these very local effects. So we had to find an explanation how we are arriving at these very local effects. And what we came up with you know, using a, a, you know, a couple of additions to this dynamic model is the, 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 only, the only way we can get local effects is assuming uh, two different things. One thing is that these transplanted cells globally change surface tension. But they have to do one more thing. They have to locally, right below the patch of transplanted cells, they have to locally modulate active radio cell integrations. Only in this uh, scenario, we can get local effects on the interface. So we have to assume that they, um, what these surface cells are doing when they're expanding is not only changing uh, the surface tension of the plastoderm, but they also locally change the ability of deep cells to undergo active radio intercalations and thereby uh, generating active radio stress within the plastoderm. So that was a prediction from the model, an entire prediction from the model, which comes also for the local um, you know, uh, inhibition of doming movements. They would only work if you're assuming that these surface cells would locally inhibit radiant intercalation of deep cells. OK. So what we wanted to know is um, you know, how would, and you know, I provide you here only with a, you know, a slightly hand-waving explanation, how would expansion of surface cells trigger active intercalation of deep cells? That's something we, you know, and apparently the, the theory predicts it. What we found is <clears throat> if you're comparing now white type cells to mutant cells in which EBR uh, sparing is being uh, um, defective, and you're looking at the density of deep cells below the surface cells, what we found is that the density in white type cells is smaller than the density in mutant cells, indicating that spreading of EBR cells reduces the density of deep cells below. And conversely, if you're looking at the motility of cells below the surface in white type embryos, which are competent to expand to mutant embryos, which cannot expand, then we're finding that motility is higher in white type embryos compared to mutant embryos, indicating that spreading of surface cells, one you know, potential mechanism which could be in place here is that spreading of surface cells not only reduces surface tension, but reduces density of deep cells locally below the um, spreading cells. And this local reduction in density leads to, an, um, to deep cells be, uh, becoming more motile and therefore uh, becoming competent to undergo active radio cell integrations. OK. So, so what we end up is now a model where we have these two effects, surface, uh, um, surface t tension reduction and active radio integrations, which have to be both taken into account. If you're taking both into account in a model which combines both of these effects, then you're getting a very close, and we're taking all our measure parameters in there, about tissue viscosity and, um, and surface tensions, then we're getting a very uh, very clear match between the experimental ob observed uh, um, changes in geometry during the process of doming to the experimental predictions, which is really striking by looking at features of uh, the relative distribution of surfaces from the York cell and the blastoderm, changes in the height of the blastoderm relative to the York cell, and changes in the contact angle at the contact line over here. And for all these different geometric, geometrical um, features, you get a very close match between our theoretical predictions and the experimental observations. And that is not really overfitting anything here, because you're putting a lot of parameters in, which constrain the remaining uh, parameters that you have to fit here. OK, 
So, so what we are ending up is now a model where we have plasterdom surface tension, where we propose that plasterdom surface tension reduction is one of the main driving forces which trigger doming. That radi deep cell contraction facilitates doming. It acts, you know, it, it, it's uh, also required for doming. And that EVL expansion triggers both plasterdom surface tension reduction and radi deep cell layer contraction. And that's it. Okay, thank you.